the mid 18th century, fire eaters played a decisive role in the secession of southern states from the Union. Through political activism, media interaction, and even armed conflicts, fire eaters paved the way for a divided Union, standing at the front line of the secession. One such fire eater was Lawrence Massillon Kidd. Born in St. Matthew, South Carolina, on October 4, 1824, Kit grew up on his father's plantation home and attended St. Matthew's Academy as a boy, where he was famous for foot races, the gift of gab, and for never wincing when flogged. He enrolled at South Carolina College in 1839, where he studied classics, became a skilled orator, and fashioned a conservative ideology in line with that of many of his classmates, committed to preserving the Southern way of life. After graduating from South Carolina College in 1843, Kett moved to Charleston to practice law under the guidance of James L. Pettigrew, the state attorney general at the time. After passing the bar in 1844, Kett moved to Orangeburg to open up his own practice. However, the details of Kett's career are hazy. During 1865, when Sherman marched to the sea, almost every single courthouse that he came across was destroyed. Not a single letter or document exists that proves that Kett ever even tried a case. However, his election to the South Carolina State House in 1848 makes it clear that most likely he had a successful legal career. After serving five terms in the South Carolina legislature, Kett was elected to the third congressional district of South Carolina in the United States House of Representatives in 1853, a position that he held until 1860 when he left to serve in the South Carolina Secession Convention. He was also one of eight delegates to serve in the Provisional Congress of the Confederacy in Montgomery, Alabama, and later Richmond, Virginia. In 1862, he left to join the Wall. As the commanding officer of the 20th South Carolina Volunteers, Kidd defended the Charleston Harbor against Union attacks for two years before leading his regiment north to join the Army of Northern Virginia. During the Battle of Cold Harbor, Kit was mortally wounded, and he died two days later on June 2, 1864. His body lies in eternal rest in his family cemetery in St. Matthews. Alongside men like Robert Barnwell Rett, Louis T. Wigfall, and Edmund Ruffin, Kett was one of the secessionist politicians that historians refer to as fire eaters. Now a question we must ask ourselves is, who were the fire eaters? Specifically refers to people like Kit who were uh, bound and determined that um, South Carolina was going to secede from the Union. Issue here. The issue is uh, a group of men who controlled the legislature and just about everything else in South Carolina, the, the economy, the finances, and so forth, um, were sort of at the head of the line as far as the, the very aggressive, dynamic, fire eater type people who believed in states' rights and uh, slavery and all of those things. In the age of Lincoln, the fundamental ideals of the United States and the vision for the future of the nation were very much open to interpretation. Debates raged as to what the Founding Fathers had intended for the country, and division spread across the fabric of the nation. The issue of slavery lay at the heart of much of the debate, as well as the role of the government in state and private matters. In the South, fire eaters feared the spreading abolitionist movement and insisted that they could safeguard slavery, the peculiar institution only if they placed it beyond the reach of its enemies in the North. The fire eaters, so to speak, came into play when Lincoln was elected. You know, they had drawn a line in the sand, and that line did not include Lincoln being their president. And so um, that was really the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, I don't think there was room for compromise after Lincoln's election. Not all fire eaters had the same sentiments towards secession, though, 
as Lawrence Kett, among other moderate secessionists, clung to the hope that there could be a way to preserve the agrarian republic and the southern way of life without complete division of the Union. However, with the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, many Southerners, especially the fire eaters, saw it as a formidable threat against the South and its institutions. Keeping in line with the rhetorical tradition of the fire eaters, Kett promoted the interests of the South through passionate speeches in Congress and by playing to the interests of his fellow secessionists. Despite his fiery rhetoric, Kett wanted to avoid violence at least in the early 1850s. Kett tells Buchanan that we'll never, South Carolina will never succeed and South Carolina will never go to war with the Union. Kett and his wife and others uh, were good friends of President Buchanan who preceded Lincoln, and uh, they had a lot to say about what went on in Washington. Following the Brooks-Sumner Affair in 1856, the scales tipped in favor of promoting violence in order to preserve the interests of the South. Four years later, Abraham Lincoln was elected, and Kett, along with the other fire eaters, had no choice but to advocate full secession from the Union, even at the cost of war. Early in the war, Kett was aware the South was fighting an uphill battle, as demonstrated in his letter to James Henry Hammond in 1861. My dear governor, I agree with you that we are building upon the most unsubstantial foundations. The government will neither buy nor advance upon cotton, and if the war lasts, its financial policy, unless corrected, will land us in bankruptcy. It does seem to me as if we are to live from hand to mouth. I fear that by next spring our army will have considerably melted away if there be no improvement in its commissariat and hospitals. Where are we to get shoes and woolen clothes for them? I have asked, but no powder is being made either. I am afraid that we are fighting, as you say, with one hand tied behind our backs. We adjourn Saturday. I expect to leave tomorrow night for home. Lawrence Massillon Kitt. The Civil War brought the ideals of fire eaters like Kett and Whigs like Lincoln to a physical confrontation no longer confined to the realms of debate and theory. Despite the fundamental differences between the two ideologies in terms of slavery, the fire eaters and Whigs actually had a lot in common. The fire eaters desired to maintain the southern way of life, but they recognized that modernization was inevitable if the southern economy was to survive. Their vision for an independent south included the need for internal improvements such as new railroads and new agricultural practices. This focus mirrors the Whig platforms of modernization and internal improvements, but these dreams ended with the defeat of the Confederacy. Ultimately, the Whigs and Fire Eaters each held an ideal vision for the future, and it was their commitment to this ideal that brought them to the point of no return, war. Kett was one of eight delegates selected to represent the state of South Carolina in the Provisional Confederate Congress in 1860. But in 1862, he decided to trade in his top hat for a regiment of South Carolina volunteers. He was sent to Charleston to defend the Charleston Harbor and Battery Wagner, with the 20th South Carolina Infantry Regiment. Given his success in warding off the Union Army in Charleston, his regiment was ordered to move north to meet up with Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia in 1864. Shortly before the Battle of Cold Harbor, Kett's regiment was sent on a reconnaissance patrol. While Kett was leading his regiment, he was mortally wounded with a musket ball lodged in his liver, and he died two days later on June 2, 1864. He now rests in his family cemetery in St. Matthew, South Carolina. After a public career that spanned almost 20 years, he had achieved only the destruction of his state and section. It was the product of his relentless quest for Southern independence. Southern men, the thunders mutter, northern flags and south winds flutter. To arms, to arms, to arms, to arms, in Dixie. Send them back your fierce defiance, stamp upon the cursed alliance. To arms, to arms.